Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Our host is Dr. Adam Lauther, co-founder and vice president for research at the National Institute for Deterrence Studies. The Anwa Deterrence Center is a 501c3 organization ensuring a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent and its ongoing modernization. Thank you for listening and welcome to the show. The views of the host and the guests are their own. Welcome to another exciting episode of NucleCast. Of course, I'm your host, Adam Lowther. And today we have a great guest, Dr. Mark Wortman, who is an independent historian and freelance journalist. He has a new book coming out on Tom Watson. We were talking about it before the show, and that book promises a great deal of drama. If you're interested in IBM, which is an iconic American company, and you want to know all the behind the scenes drama, read his new book on the Watson family and on Tom Watson. But that's not why we're here to talk today. Today, we're talking all about Admiral Hyman Rickover, and he has a book on that, a uh, uh, 2022 book out of Yale University Press called Hyman, Admiral Hyman Rickover, Engineer of Power, and it is a very well-rated, very well-written book. And of course, I would uh, recommend you pick up the Watson book. You'll love that, and then read Hyman Rickover as well. Mark, welcome to NucleCast. Thank you, Adam. Glad to be here. So we were, you know, our plan for this episode is to talk about Hyman Rickover, you know, who is one of the, uh, you know, an iconic American. He's an American legend. I was, you know, I was a Navy guy. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a, you know, a nuclear Navy guy, but any sailor knows about Hyman Rickover. And we, we've heard stories about putting lieutenants in closets and, you know, the interview process. We, we've all heard about that. But before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about your career because, you know, don't tell anybody this, this is between you and me, but I'm envious of your ability to be an independent author and, and journalist. So I would love to know, how have you done that? How does that work for those folks out there who write for a living, write books, you know, particularly nonfiction? How do you go about getting into that kind of a career? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always jealous of the people uh, like you, Adam, who have uh, solid day jobs that, uh, <laughs> that give them enough flexibility to be able to do other things. But uh, but I'm happy to talk about it. It's um you know, it's frankly, it's a hustling career. Uh, you have to, uh, you have to be somebody who loves to write, who loves to learn, uh, and who isn't given to writer's block. You know, in my life, I've never had what people call writer's block. It just uh, isn't something that that stymies me. Uh, I get up in the morning and I go to work and, uh, I'm, I'm a deadline writer for, uh, in many er uh, in, uh, I'm a deadline writer who knows that I have to make that deadline because I've got a gun to my head that says, you're not going to get paid if you don't get the work done. Um, I combine journalism with my love for history uh, military history, uh, social history, the history of ideas, uh, in writing books. And so it's, it's a combination of you get advances for books that are sold to trade publishers. Hopefully the advance is big enough, uh, gives you enough rope to hang yourself with, so to speak. And then, um, I fill in the gaps, and there are big gaps, with journalism. I write for Vanity Fair. Uh, I'm working on an article right now for Rolling Stone magazine. Um, I've written for Smithsonian, Time, um, multiple other publications. And you you, you got to be willing to do the work and hustle and sort of figure out how to make that, that discipline work. Still, that said... It's, uh, I haven't won the lottery, 
so to speak, by having a big bestseller. Um, I have sold some things to uh, Hollywood, and that, of course, uh, is gravy. Um, and uh, you just you just try to make it try to make it work. Um, you know, happily added to that, I have a wife who uh, who has a, a regular job, and so that um, has uh, brought us some uh, some of the uh, healthcare benefits that uh, that also, of course, are important. But it's it's hard, especially these days when the um, you know the internet publishing business has sort of um, made it a kind of race to the bottom uh, as far as as payments go, but um, you know, uh, you just make it work. And, uh, if you love what you do and you want that freedom, um, then you accept sort of the, uh, the challenges there. So, yeah. um, you know, one day, Adam, uh, you got to give it a try cause, uh, you're a young guy and, and, uh, you know, there's no time like the present. Yeah. It's funny. The, the wife and I have thought, well, once the kids are raised, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll we'll you know sell the house, buy an RV, travel the country, and ride on the road. That's sort of oh, what I had thought about. Okay. That was that's like our dream. So okay, <laughs> well, well, you know, one day you'll you'll live that dream. So let's uh, you know, thanks for sharing. I'm, it's always uh, interesting to learn about how people get where they go, and it's inspiring to see pe- other people succeed in interesting ways. So. Let, let's now talk about Hyman Rickover. So, you know, give us an outline of the book and, and you know, give us a, a sense of who Hyman Rickover was. Who was this man? Yeah. Um, so Hyman Rickover uh, has been called by uh, President Jimmy Carter, the greatest engineer who ever lived. Uh, one of his critics, uh, also a, a nuclear submarine officer, uh, Edward, Captain Ed, Edward Beach, uh, said he undoubtedly uh, brought the greatest revolution in warships in the history of maritime affairs. Uh, Hyman Rickover was uh, a Jew born in, uh, in Poland uh, shortly before 1900. Uh, emigrated to the United States as a young boy, uh, managed by hook or by crook to get a a nomination to the Naval Academy. Uh, He went through the Navy uh, during World War II. He was ahead of what was called the electrical section section of the Navy Bureau of Ships, responsible for all electrical systems on U.S. Navy warships. After After World War II, it appeared that his career was at an end, but he managed to get himself uh, appointed to head, head up a Navy team that went to Oak Ridge, scene of uh, the Manhattan Project, uh, development of the atomic bomb, to look into the possibilities for creating a nuclear reactor that could potentially become a ship reactor. Uh, this seemed like a just a crazy notion because, of course, uh, everything that was known then about uh, nuclear f- uh, fission was that it led to a ch- chain reaction that could become a bomb, that uh, the bombs that in- incinerated Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Rickover put together a team. They studied the reactor, and he realized this was an engineering problem. If you could contain that nuclear reaction in, uh, inside a vessel, you could essentially create a form of energy to boil up steam, to drive a turbine, and with that, you could run a submarine underwater almost in depth, indefinitely. You could power a warship on the surface, again, almost indefinitely. Uh, and after during the Cold War, uh, uh, with the Navy's role actually uncertain what it would be, uh, he convinced uh, the Navy and the new Department of Energy, or what became the Department of Energy, to create a, uh, a program called uh, nuclear uh, Naval Reactors. And he promised, starting out in 1949, that uh, by 1955, uh, he would have a submarine under nuclear power at sea. 
and he achieved that. He achieved that in January 1955. It's an extraordinary thing to have done. At the same time, he created the first uh, civilian, fully civilian nuclear power plant uh, for uh, illuminating uh, uh, the region around Pittsburgh. Uh, in 1958, a submarine transited the North Pole under the polar ice cap. Unbelievable accomplishment. Uh, what this meant for the United States Navy cannot be under uh, overestimated. It meant that the U.S., as Rick Over said, could now go where we want, when we want. We sort of accept this notion that uh, American, the American Navy is able to project force with its uh, nuclear carriers, uh, all nucle- uh, all uh, nuclear carriers, and its all nuclear fleet of, of atomic submarines. Uh, but before Rickover came along, we did not have these capabilities at all. Uh, and it really has marked a huge revolution in naval affairs uh, that truly transformed what uh, what it took to maintain uh, freedom of the seas. So uh, Carter was probably right in saying that he was certainly one of the greatest engineers who ever lived. He was also one of the most controversial, and we can talk about that too. So you know, we've it's an interesting story for how he, cause I mean, in the end he, he stays in the Navy longer than any other officers ever stayed in the Navy. When does he finally retire? So he was forcibly retired against his will in 1981. So he was by then, he was 81 years old. He had under normal rules, uh, he, sh- uh, by age 64, he, he, sh- faced mandatory retirement. But even going back well before that, when he was in the process of building the first nuclear reactors, engineering them for what went into the uh, USS Nautilus, the first nuclear-powered vessel, the Navy was trying to get rid of him. The Navy hated him. They hated his uh, his uh, obnoxious ways. He refused to obey the chain of or to go through the chain of command. He refused to wear his uniform. He insisted that there was no uh, hierarchy in matters of of the mind, and except for the ability of uh, one's intellectual ability. This was not the Navy way, and he was constantly fighting the Navy. Uh, And the Navy wanted to get rid of him. And he managed, because of what he was achieving with the Nautilus, he managed to get Congress on his side. And the Navy passed him over for promotion in uh, 1952. They had uh, selection boards of flag rank officers whose job it was was to say which captains were going to be uh, promoted to flag rank. And Rickover was passed over twice. Under naval regulations, uh, you were, it's up or out. And Rickover was facing mandatory retirement then. He managed to get uh, Congress on his side, uh, and it became a cause celebre. And uh, he was, uh, they set up a new selection board because Congress said, if you do not promote Rick over, we are going to take over the promotion process. The Navy was scared uh, out of its polished, spit and polished uh, shoes. And so uh, the brass convened a new selection board. They said, we have to have an engineering duty officer with uh, experience in running a nuclear power program uh, promoted to Admiral. Uh, you know, as Rick Over said, they might as well have named a, uh, said they wanted a 126-pound Jew promoted. And uh, they did indeed promote him. Uh, and he, so he continued on. Uh, his accomplishments made him friends in Washington. They made him enemies in the, in the Navy. And every time the Navy tried to push him out after that, uh, as one uh, uh, naval officer said, 
uh, if the CNO chief naval officer goes up against Rickover, it's the chief naval officer who will fall. Um, and it happened several times. Uh, this uh, was, you know, Rickover's uh, way of operating. He was a fighter. He was a tough, tough guy. If you went up against Rickover, he would fight you, and you had better be prepared because if he was going to fight to the death for what he believed in. Well, that's uh, that's that's so interesting. Now, so uh, you know, I've heard stories, and I don't know what's true and what isn't about how he selected officers yeah. for the you know for naval nuclear officers. What was the reality of that? Uh, the reality was probably crazier than what you heard. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Rickover managed uh, to gain control of the selection of all nuclear officers in the Navy. So all nuclear officers had to go through Rickover. He interviewed over 15,000 candidates and his process you know, uh, was to, to first, of course, to test them, um, have staff test them in technical areas. He, uh, and then when they came in for their final interview with him, as soon as they sat down, they slid to the floor or started sliding to the floor because he took a chair and cut off the front legs of the chair, about six inches of the front legs of the chair to, uh, with the goal of immediately putting these young men off balance. Uh, and it was young men when he was in the Navy. No women had yet come into the service. Uh, and then uh, he uh, started peppering them with questions. Uh, in the first years of his doing this, he would ask them everything from, uh, you know, um, you'd come in and he'd say, define for me what religion is. And then he'd say, tell me what the last 10 books you, you read were and why they were significant. Uh, he would look at their, uh, their grades. Uh, Jimmy Carter, a nuclear submarine officer, um, came in and, and Rickover looked at his, uh, his uh, Naval Academy record. And uh, Carter was proud of his record. He was very high ranked. And, and uh, Rickover sa uh, saw a low grade and said, well, did you do your best? And Carter was about to say, well, yes, I did. And then uh, he held up for a second. And then he said, no, sir, I didn't always do my best. And Rick overlooked him and said, why not? And then turned his back to him. And Carter knew that was the end of the interview. He thought he might not have even gotten into, into the uh, service. In fact, he did. Uh, and Carter actually went on to name his, call his uh, campaign autobiography, Why Not the Best?, and uh, he said that Rickover was one of the two most important people in his life, his father being the other. Uh, Rickover asked of these candidates sometimes very controversial questions uh, about their sex life. He'd ask them about their plans for uh, for uh, having raising a family. He seemed to be opposed to the idea that you could uh, have a large family and be in the Navy. Um, one time he asked a, uh, a guy to uh, call up, said, you have a choice. You can be uh, be a nuclear submarine officer or you can get married. And uh, the guy was had a fiance and, and he pushed, Rick over pushed the phone across the table, said, you should call your fiance and break it off if you want to be in my Navy. The guy called up his fiance, broke it off right there. And then Rick over said to him, you cannot be in my Navy. Anybody who would do that is not worthy of being in my Navy. And he, uh, he uh, marched out. He didn't, he didn't make it. You know, this was, there was a cruelty to him. Uh, he would order these uh, young men who had been uh, gone through the uh, Naval Academy or ROTC and been told, basically, you get an order, you obey it and tell them, march into that wall. And uh, the young men would march into the wall. You know, and that was basically a signal. This was not somebody Rick over wanted in his Navy. Uh, he'd say, you know, make me angry. What can you do to make me angry? Young man uh, reached across the table, smashed 
a valuable model of, uh, I think, of the Nautilus to the floor, destroying it. And Rick, uh, Rick over screamed his head off at the guy, marched him out of the office, and he accepted him, accepted him into the program. You know, so there were all kinds of things that he would do. Uh, it, there were finally so many uh, protests against it that he always kept uh, another officer in the office with him uh, to to uh, uh, record what was going on. Uh, oh, and then if he didn't like your answer, he would banish you to a broom closet. He would say, you go sit in that closet and you and you uh, stew on this for a while and come back when you're ready to answer my question properly. Um, uh, uh, Elmo Zumwalt, later uh, chief of naval operations, uh, at the time already a decorated captain, son of an admiral, uh, high naval academy graduate, uh, decorated former uh, uh, naval aide to uh, to the president. You know, this was uh, somebody who had lots of experience. Rick Over banished him to the closet, not once, but twice. You know, and for Zumwalt, this uh, led to sort of a, a career-long feud with, uh, with the admiral there. Uh, and this was, you know, this... Uh, Rick Over was the head of a fourth echelon uh, branch of the Navy, and yet he had the Navy by the short hairs, and he kept a really firm grip on it. This episode of Nuclecast is brought to you by the Anwa Deterrent Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. Yeah, it's, it's interesting for me as somebody who's, you know, I spent most of my career with the Air Force. And so I always think, you know, to Billy Mitchell is sort of this maverick guy who, but, but Mitchell really didn't hold a candle in his uniqueness and his sort of influence as Rick overheld over the Navy. I mean, he truly sort of was a one of a kind across all services. Do you, do you think his approach was effective? his approach to selecting officers, mm -hmm. did it really work the way he had hoped to? You know, I guess the proof is in the pudding and there has in the entire history of the nuclear Navy, hundreds of millions of miles and many uh, millions of hours of operation. There has never been a nuclear accident. It's an extraordinary record. If you compare it to uh, the old Soviet Union and Russia, uh, there have been many accidents for them with great loss of life and uh, environmental destruction. There has not been a single accident involving a nuclear, a naval nuclear reactor. It's an extraordinary record. Um, and then as far as the selection of people, Rickover took what you could call the cream of the crop. Some called it the uh, uh, the nuclear navy uh, uh, Nazi. Um, he many CNOs came out of the nuclear navy. Uh, these are uh, these are extraordinarily smart, capable people uh, who understand technology. They understand how to fight a how to operate and fight a ship and uh, they have risen to the top within the Navy. Uh, and within the Navy, uh, he created uh, not just uh, a culture of safety for, for nuclear submarines, uh, particularly after the Thresher disaster, uh, but that culture spread throughout the entire Navy so that uh, ships, through, uh, surface ships, uh, have a, a, now have a similar uh, demand for uh, safe operation records. Um, so it's it's really an extraordinary record. And if you ask people who operate these ships, the nuclear ships the, and the submarines, they will tell you that Rickover's imprint is everywhere. It continues to be uh, strongly present throughout the Navy. 
So it's that time in the show where I would normally bring out Bob. I have a genie, picked him up in the desert. And Bob grants three wishes to all the guests because, I mean, I've already had my wishes. So I'll rub that lamp. Bob pops out. Now, now your wishes are confined to our topics that we've been discussing today. So if you were to have, let's say, well, for one, we've got the we, we've got a new ship coming, don't we? Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, sir, we do. So uh, on October 14th, uh, the new USS Rickover, SSN 795, will be commissioned, will join the United States Navy. It uh, will be uh, the most advanced submarine uh, in the history of the Navy, you know, and will honor uh, Admiral Rickover. Uh, there is a previous submarine Rickover, which was uh, named for him in his lifetime, a rare honor. Um, and this uh, this new Rickover will be a, a, a killer attack sub uh, carrying both uh, missiles and torpedoes um, and have just extraordinary capabilities. Nothing like it in the world uh, except other members of its class. Um, and these submarines now, when you think about over the past uh, uh, 60 plus years of uh, nuclear naval operations, you know, including the Cold War, uh, you think that we live in a world where there are grave tensions. There are uh, nations that possess nuclear weaponry uh, that they uh aim at each other, you know, usually when nations have uh, weapons capabilities uh, and enemies or adversaries, eventually they choose to use them. Uh, thanks to these nuclear submarines, and I guess you could say uh, as well uh, our uh, uh, Russian counterpart, there has been sort of this decision that you can't use a nuclear weapon. You can't use a low yield nuclear weapon that if you do nothing can stop what we have out at sea at this very moment and that umbrella shields us against the worst human impulses and let's hope that continues i agree i agree now back to bob so you get three yeah. wishes yes sir. what would your what would your three wishes be Gosh, well, uh, and, it's, and if it's, you say sell some more books, that's okay. That's understandable. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, I'm I'm not gonna. Uh, I certainly encourage all your listeners to to read my books. Um, I've read, ranged widely, um, and uh, you know they're they're exciting subjects for me. Well, you know, you start off with what Rick Over said at the very end of his career in his last uh, testimony. At um, on Capitol Hill, he said, if I could, I'd sink them all. And that's, but he knew you couldn't. You know, that's simply a, uh, this pie in the sky wish because you've got this genie in the desert uh, that says, wow, what, wouldn't it be great if we could put that, uh, that, uh, close that Pandora's box back up, but that Pandora's box has been open now. So uh, that that certainly would be one wish because uh, maybe that would bring greater uh, greater peace and stability to the world. Um, you know, by God, uh, I you know I certainly wish that uh, Putin would come to his senses and realize that. Uh, a brutal war of aggression no longer works in this world and that uh, he's got to stop that. Um, you know, again, this is, this is hope against hope. Um, and last but not least, I would hope that Americans learn and study and uh, continue to try to uh, work their way through the, the complexities of our, uh, of our difficult times. We have so much information coming at us 
a lot of it is untrue. A lot of misinformation gets flung at us. You know, uh, as Rick Over said to be uh, uh, poorly educated in uh, a dangerous world is to invite catastrophe. So educate yourself. Educate yourself constantly. Don't believe sources until you've confirmed them in multiple ways. And uh, so that would be uh, my last wish. Yeah. Good wish. And of course, yeah, by God, buy my books. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, I, I appreciate you uh, coming on the show with us today. It was, you know, I, I knew a little bit about Rick over, but I, like you said, the truth is is even more fascinating than than the rumor. So, th- thanks for sharing that with us. All right, Adam. Well, thank you so much for having me, uh, and thanks to your listeners for taking the time to listen. And like like Mark said, thanks for to you the listeners for joining us, and we hope you'll join us on the next episode of Nuclecast. You know that was. Uh, such a good interview. I actually forgot to take a, a break because uh, I just enjoyed the, you know, the discussion of Rick over. He truly was an interesting character. And I don't know for, for those military folks now, could you imagine somebody like Hyman Rick over in the modern Navy, the modern Air Force, you know, with, with the personality that he had with his eccentricities, with his sort of, maverick nature i i'm pretty confident that uh he would not have survived just the way you know the system works now so it it was interesting to see what he did and how he did it and how he sort of as mark pointed out how he bucked the system but then when it came to the the actual reactors he was you know safety first because he knew uh, a reactor failure, a reactor, you know, problem would have killed the nuclear Navy. So he demanded absolute safety. So uh, interesting conversation. Hopefully you enjoyed it. This has been a production of the ANWA Deterrence Center, a 501c3 that seeks to educate key decision makers, stakeholders, and the public to ensure a broader understanding of the nation's strategic nuclear deterrent. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Grunkel. Help us grow our followers by sharing it and follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at NuclearCast.